persons that would like to go back, they can do that now. Rhonda's waiting. Adam, you waiting? I'm waiting. Okay. I think that's all that's going back. You ready? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to have you in our lives. Father, we're so blessed that you love us. Father, we're also blessed to have Gary and his family here with us. Father, I pray that you work in Gary, continue to work in his family. Watch over them as they're spread all over the world. Watch over him as he brings a lesson to us today. Father, I pray that it's a lesson that he's committed to his heart and he knows is from you. And I pray that we hear it, that we hear it and we take it with us through this week. Father, we are so blessed to have this time to worship you. And we're blessed to have so many people here with us today. Just help us to be open to what Gary brings us today is a message from your word. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Adam. So good morning, everyone. Y'all seem excited to be here. That enthusiastic good morning. You know, last week was when we changed our clocks. We don't need to be carrying over to this week. Last week, it was okay to fall asleep during my preaching. This week, it's not. So, before we get started, I want to mention about our Mexico Mission Spaghetti Fundraiser Lunch, which is Sunday, April 7th. We would love for you to come and be a part of that. Uh, it is to... Um, raise funds for airfare, food expenses for the Mexico mission trip to the children, city of children, to the city of children in uh, Mexico and uh, getting ready for that. So the cost, I mean, spaghetti with meat, sauce, salad, bread, dessert, and drink uh, is $20 for adults, kids 10 and under $5. And you can pay more than that. This is a fundraiser, okay? You can pay lots more than that. In fact, we have the Power of 100. Is that what it's called, Jilda? Power of 100, the envelopes in the back wall. To uh, take an envelope, whatever number is on it, put that much cash in there, or more if you'd like, and give that to Brandon or Jilda. And uh, that goes towards the Mexico mission trip. Once again, that is helping orphans down in Mexico. So we would love for you to be a part of this ministry. Now, as far as the fundraiser goes, you know, we've only had like two sign up so far. And I know sometimes we are a group of people who like to wait to the last minute. Okay, stop that. <laughs> Don't do that. Sign up now. Come and be a part of, of this fundraiser. So church, we have, and to our guests, you didn't know this, but we have been going <clears throat> through the I am statements of Jesus in the book of John and studying those a little bit and asking, you know, what's in a name? And each one of these gives us a little bit different glimpse into the life of Jesus and what he means to us, okay? We have studied those one by one this week. Uh, we're going to study one next week is where uh, Jesus says, I am the vine. And then on Easter Sunday, I am the resurrection and life, which is a reminder, uh, Easter Sunday, March 31st at 6.30 in the morning, a.m. in the morning, O dark 30, we will be on the beach, and we would love for you to come and join us to our guests. If you'll be gone by then, just simply come back. That's all you got to do. And you, too, can be with us on the beach for sunrise service 6.30 a.m., and we're looking forward to that, and then we'll come back here, and we're going to have a big breakfast, and then we're going to come in here, and I'm going to preach, and you'll be tired, but that's okay. I'm going to have you stand for the whole sermon. <laughs> Not really, but uh, that's the way it is. Our, our next two weeks are going, though, on the I am statements of, of Jesus. Now, we get those where it harkens back to the Hebrew Bible, to the Old Testament of uh, Moses and uh, what God told Moses in the burning bush 
uh, Yahweh being I am who I am. That's where all of this started. That's where it all began. And then Jesus is saying these and giving these examples and things that he's talking about are everyday things that they can totally understand. I am the, I am the gate. They understood gates. I am, I am the good shepherd. They understood those types of things. And today, today we're going to read and uh, study a little bit about Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So let's begin in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is a familiar verse here that we oftentimes hear where? At funerals, right? We oftentimes hear this at funerals. Let, so, no funerals today, but just what Jesus is, is, is telling his group of disciples there. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And then Jesus says something here that's really interesting to me. I've, I've, so many times I've read these verses. He says, and you know the way to where I'm going. And good old Thomas spoke up and said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then we come to our I am statement for today. And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I like this. Uh, and, and you know, you can say this like this. I am the way. And the truth and the life. Depends on how you emphasize what he says here. Thomas wanted to know the way, and the Lord answered with, I am the way. Do you figure probably Thomas is even a little more confused at that? Jesus confused his followers oftentimes. To where they were left scratching their heads. To know the way, then, is to follow him as he first called his disciples. And then the Lord added to that, not only I'm the way, answering Thomas's question, but he says, oh, and the truth and the life. Another way we could read this, I don't know if y'all ever do this, but how you emphasize, like I said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. How about I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. I think it's very neat here how it gives us some insight because these three I am's right here are fundamental. We're going to take a look at them this morning. When he talks about the way, when he says, I am the way, you know, that has to exclude all other ways. I am the way. This excludes all other men and women and persons of intellect or entitlement. It, it, it excludes all heads of all religious callings. Yeah, it excludes Buddha and gurus and Muhammad and all men's ways of beliefs and practices. It excludes your church's preacher as well as your church's elders and deacons and anybody else. It excludes us all. There's only one way. One way. One, one, the way, and it's Christ's way, because he is 
the way. That's easy. One way. No one comes to the Father but by me. By the way, you probably remember, in the early church, all Christians were pretty much known as people of the way. You remember that? You probably do. It was recognized that they followed the way, they followed Jesus, the way of Jesus. The, the, the community pretty much gave that term to them. We see in Acts, first one here, <clears throat> meanwhile, Paul, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him to, for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, the way, with a man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. This verse, these verses here, taken, this is right before he has quite the encounter on the Damascus Road. Then we see on over <clears throat> in Acts chapter 19, verses 8 and 9, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Going on down in, in chapter 19, we see about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. And then lastly, Acts 24, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. It, they were known as the way. You, you think maybe we are the way? We're part of the way? The Lord's way? Yes. Maybe we ought to change our sign out front. And we just put the way. That's a good idea. Yeah. The way. Jesus is the way. That's what he's telling. Thomas asked the question. Well, know the way. Where are you going? He just says, I'm the way. And then Jesus' next two claims here kind of follow on from the first one. Jesus is the way, the foundation. You ever travel with somebody and say, do you know the way? And they say, sure. And you quickly find out they don't know the way. I don't know the way. Jesus is the way. That's the way I want to follow. So then, with the way being the foundation, there can only be one truth built upon that way. And only one life that comes out of that way. Because He is the way to the Father and to heaven. And the only way of life, then he must be the truth, the only truth, and the only life to follow on from that. He is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. For us, that should mean a great deal. The Lord is the truth. His word is true. Everything he spoke was truth. In church, we need to hold fast to that truth. Sometimes we don't like the truth. Or as a, fa a famous actor said, you can't handle the truth. Church, we need to rise up against false teaching. And when I say something like that, that means like, well, let's get in her face. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that. You don't have to be ugly, but you don't have to accept false teaching. We need to maintain the purity of the truth. Live surrendered lives for the one who is the truth. You want to know where to go? Well, Jesus is the way. You want to know what is right? Well, Jesus is the truth. You want eternal life? And do you want to have that abundant life? Well, guess what? Jesus is the life. This is good stuff, people. 
Jesus is the way to God, the truth of God, the life of God. Those three things, they're, they're, they're eternal. Eternal life is a, is a great theme in John's gospel. I was reading somewhere, it said that, 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 that in John's gospel, there are 17 verses that deal with eternal life. I didn't actually go and count those, so if any of you do, let me know if that is the truth. But I know he does talk about eternal life quite a bit. In this verse, saying Christianity is, in the, you know, I am the way, the truth, and life. Is, is Christianity then an exclusive religion? <laughs> yeah, sure, it is. It is. But it's, it's, it's both inclusive and ex exclusive. It includes all who want to come to know the Lord. Jesus calls everyone. But it excludes all other ways and through the one who said I am the way no one comes to the father but through me man preacher that's kind of harsh that's in your bible let us look at another little slant here on the word life we just looked at Jesus being the only way to eternal life he's also the only way to sustain or give us fulfilling life I mean the life that sustains us each day eternal life is wonderful living with God forever that's our goal to love God follow God believe have faith have that eternal life with God forevermore but I don't think that what Jesus is talking about right here, I'm the way, the truth, and life, is only meaning the eternal life. I think that is life that sustains us as Christians every single day of our lives. God graciously provides that day-to-day -day life in the Holy Spirit for us. The abundant life, abundant life is the focus of John chapter 10. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come they may have life and have it abundantly. And then the second part of, uh, of verse 6 from our text reinforces what we've already been obtaining from these verses. No one comes to the Father except through me. Some people, you know, some people claim that God is embracing and all good people and all people who live a good life will be taken to heaven. All you got to do is live a good life. You go to heaven. That sounds... That sounds neat and it sounds good. And sometimes I, I want to believe that. But what Gary believes, if it doesn't line up with what is taught in the Bible, but get what Gary believes can be totally wrong. Because the belief that, well, God just, you know, if you're good, then God's just going to take you to heaven. You go to funerals and hear about how good somebody was. Did they obey the gospel? Oh, they lived a good life. They were sinless. Well, actually, Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Hmm. Some people want us to overlook Jesus as the only way. And propose that good works can bring one to the Father. Then if you ever have any interfaith dialogue, you know, talking to people of other faiths, some claim common ground, saying that, well, you know, any good and faithful Buddhist or Muslim or whatever is accepted by God all on equal ground. They claim there are several paths to God through faith, as they use the word faith. Church, there's no other way to God the Father except through Jesus the Son. And let me tell you, I am not anti-Muslim or anti-Buddhist or anti-anything else. I can love people. But I don't necessarily have to believe what they believe. And I don't necessarily believe that they can get to heaven except through Jesus. 
And that's just not Gary's beliefs. That's in your Bible. Jesus said it. Some of you have heard of the preacher, the theologian, H.A. Ironside. He was occasionally interrupted during his sermons with objections that there were hundreds of religions. And no one could, uh, could determine which was the right way. And Ironside would answer by indicating that he knew of only two religions. He says, one covers all who expect salvation by doing, basically being good, by doing, and doing good works and all like that. The other, all who have been saved by what someone had done for them. And the whole question is very simple. Can you save yourself or must you be saved by someone else? David Jeremiah, a few years ago, said that in a survey of all those who are named Christians, who call themselves Christians in churches, and this to me was rather disturbing, but in this survey, 30% of them believe Jesus is just one way to God. Now, three, in their survey, three out of every ten people who claim Christianity believe this is just one way to God. That's a terrible statistic. Wow. So, church, let me tell you, we got roughly 100 people in here today. Hopefully, prayerfully, 30 of you are not sitting there thinking, Jesus is one way to God. Now, let me tell you, Jesus is the only way. You don't like it? Cut that piece out of your Bible, I guess, where Jesus is telling you he's the only way. The only way. No one comes to the Father but by him. Well, I don't like that, preacher. Well, I can't help that. Jesus said it, not me. John 14, 6, our text there, gives us God's perspectives on what he initiated as only way the Father. Disciples were still not understanding all of this. And then later on, Later on, after Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, did they really start understanding what Jesus meant? Because then we go over to Acts 4, verse 12, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you're part of that 30%, you can cut that out of your Bible too. And if Paul was divinely inspired to write 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 6, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Jesus is the only way, the only way. And to come to him, we, we, we meet his truth, and, and we can't sidestep that. So what does this mean to us? Well, very simply, church, he is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. No other way of acceptance or redemption exists. There was a lady who was diagnosed with a terminal illness. She'd been given three months to live. She was getting her things in order. She contacted her preacher and asked him to, come to her house, discuss some of her final wishes. That really happens. I have had people do that with me and discuss their final wishes. I love doing that in one way, but I tell you what, I hate doing it in another way. They want to make things right. They want to get things settled. They even tell me sometimes what to say and what not to say. What they want, what they don't want. And she was doing all of that with her preacher. She told him which song she wanted. Rhonda and I have discussed my demise. Figuring I will die before she does. And having been in the Air Force, she says, you, you want taps? I said, well, taps is sad. 
I said, I've done a lot of military funerals, and taps is sad. Well, do you want the volleys of fire? I said, well, that's sad too. I said, why do you want it sad? You want to be buried in your uniform? No, not really. I, none, I said, Rhonda, I'll be dead. D-E-A-D. I don't care. If you want that, do it. I don't care. Do what you want. Some of you might have already put together your wish list for your funeral. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But this lady asked a preacher, said, look, I know what I want. I know what outfit I'm going to be buried in. She requested to be buried with her, with her Bible in her hands. And then as the preacher got ready to leave and had prayer with her and all, she suddenly remembered something. She said, oh, wait, there's one more thing. He said, what's that? That's always a scary thing for a preacher. Oh, one more thing. I want you to do a liturgical dance at my funeral. No. She said, there's one more thing. She said, it's very important. She said, what I want is I want to be buried with a fork in my right hand. I've had some unusual requests before for funerals. I don't think I've ever had this one, personally. He looked at her, not knowing quite what to say. She explained, she says, you know what, in all my years of attending worship and going to different socials and potluck dinners, you know, the big eatings on the ground, we're good at that. She says, when the dishes of the main course were being cleared, and they're getting ready, taking everything away, and somebody would, would lean over and say, keep your fork. She said, that was my favorite part because I knew something really good was coming. She said, we were getting ready for some apple pie or buttermilk pie or chocolate cake. Yeah. She said, so when people know I'm in that casket with a fork in my hand and they ask, what's with the fork? I want you to tell them, keep your fork. The best is yet to come. <laughs> Church, heaven's going to be far more wonderful than you or I could ever imagine. Ever. You need to keep your fork because the best is truly yet to come. Lord's coming back for us. He's coming back for those of the way. Because He is the way. The Lord is my way. He's my truth. The Lord is my life. The Lord knows the way through the wilderness. He's the way. We just need to follow. Church, we're going to have an invitation song for you. Don't know if you're a Christian. You could become a Christian this morning if you want to do that. You don't have to walk down the aisle. You can get with me later. We can baptize you today. If you need to come back to the Lord or if you need prayers, you know, it doesn't matter. Whatever your request is, we're here to help you. We're here to help you. To our guests, thank you for being with us today. You have our phone numbers. In a bulletin, while you're down here, you call us if you need anything. You call me. My phone number is there. The elders, deacons, church number, whatever you need, you're part of us. You're part of our family, family of the way. And we want to help you. If you have any needs whatsoever, we're here for you. This morning, Roger and Shirley are going to head back to the uh, conference room for any that would like to have prayer. They'll be back there to pray with you, to pray for you. Whatever you might need, uh, they will be back there. And, and also, let me mention one other thing. You know, our elders, our elders meet together weekly, Mondays at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you would ever like to come and talk to our elders, that's okay. They'd love to have prayer with you, talk with you, whatever it is that you might need. Church, we're here for you. If you have any need whatsoever this morning and you need to respond to the gospel, you can do that right now. 
while together we stand and while we sing.